international event. He will be breaking history if he's able to do so. Which would be crazy. He's got a lot of achievements. He won in Indianapolis. He won Bremen Regionals. First in Norway Nationals 2016, 2014, 2012. And let's not forget that he won the Trondheim League Challenge. <laughs> but we are straight into the game. Tort's got a win pod. Emily has got a volcano. I'm going to try even harder than I did before to pronounce his name correctly. And it looks like Todd has won the flip here. It looks like he has won the flip and he's also got one of his three Bridgets in his opening hand. So often we have said, or the pilots of this list have said, I get Bridget, I typically win. If I don't get Bridget, I typically lose. Or at least that is definitely the conditions that... Uh, roll on that lead to losses so he's got the first step already there Bridget the very first action of his turn and it's absolutely crucial and there's a big difference between starting Bridget and playing a Tapu Lele leaving it on your bench having played a Bridget I talked to Benjamin Martinson earlier today and he worked with Todd on this list and he said the exact same thing here we might be seeing a little bit more Zoroark and a little bit less Golisopod purely because Golisopod being weak to fire it's not that uh, Emily can't get a one-hit KO on a Zoroark GX. He absolutely can. It just uses a whole bunch of steam-ups in order to do so. It's much more difficult. And that's reflected in Tord grabbing two Zorua and a Tapu Koko. Definitely the best options he can go for here. Again, Wimpod has that Wimp out ability so he can freely move between uh, this Pokemon and anything else he chooses to put into the active position. If these two faces look familiar, uh, that is because we've actually had them already competing in this tournament together. And they actually ended up in a tie the last time these two faced off. And uh, we'll see if with a little bit more time on the clock now that we are in top cut, maybe we'll see a winner emerge because we actually need one. <laughs> I was going to say, there is no maybe, Joe. We will see a winner. They cannot <laughs> both go into top four. We are going to have a winner. We've got a little bit more time and we've even got, there's no such thing as a tie when you get to the knockout rounds. We've got extra rules that determine exactly who wins. We'll get into them if the need arises. Although with 75 minutes, it rarely does, which makes me very happy indeed. Now, does Torn actually have an energy? It looks like he's got a rainbow energy in hand, if I saw that no, it's correctly. Just a grass energy, I think. And an enhanced hammer. I saw the little flashes on the enhanced hammer. <laughs> So he gets the grass. That is a good turn one for Tord. It's a really solid turn one. Although he doesn't really like to attach grass energy to the Wimpod, he still has the GX attack option from Golisopod. If he can go for a two for two trade, that's not actually that bad for him if he chooses to use the GX attack from Golisopod later on in the game on one of uh, Emily's 100 HP, 180 HP EX Pokemon. Yeah, that is what he's going to need. I mean, Tord's Tor going to be very difficult. It's going to be very difficult for him to get one hit KOs. Uh, Emily here is, is not in the same position. He just needs steam up. He just needs energy. If he gets set up, I've got to think he is the favorite in this particular matchup. Tord's going to be hitting 150 with a choice band on his Zoroark, assuming he's got a full bench. And Tord's playing a whole bunch of Ace and Roller, and he's playing Puzzle of Time. That's irrelevant if you're getting one hit KO'd. And when you see something like a Turtonator GX, free energy, 160. Two steam ups, and then it becomes 220, and then those Ace Rollers are irrelevant. Zoroark GX is being KO'd. That is really what Emily's going to have to be doing here in order to be getting the KO because if he doesn't actually get one hit KOs, Tord can really punish him for that with a particular build that he's got. Yeah, it doesn't feel like there's going to be any individual turn that's going to win or lose Emily the game, but um, it's going to be a tale of every single turn. Either he can get one hit knockouts and Tord's turns become... Uh, a lot less powerful, or there'll be turns where Emily misses, you know, an extra steam up here on here or there, and Tord can start pressing the advantage back by getting these Ace Roller plays. So it's really going to be every single turn, Emily needs to be make sh making sure he can take these big knockouts. Because even though Tor's not getting the big knockouts, he should be getting consistent two hit KOs. Mm -hmm. Volcanion is not a deck that plays Ace Roller. It's not a deck that plays Max Potion. It's not a healing deck. It is a, why should I heal? <laughs> I'm getting one hit KOs on you. So either you're getting one hit KOs on me, we'll trade, it will be quick. Or you're not, and I'm going to win. I don't <laughs> need to heal. I'm not going to heal. You can't make me heal. Yeah, absolutely. A Professor Sycamore, his priority at this point is going to be trying to find some of those Zoroark GX. You've said it so often, once those are into play, the rest of the deck starts falling into place because you gain so many more draws looking for 
cards like Double Colorless the advantage even further if he can start getting two hit KOs and start setting up the Volcanian EX that's in the active. And I think it's important that he does this before Emily gets too much energy on the field. Mm -hmm. When the energy gets on the field for the Volcanian player, it goes downhill very, very quickly. It's why so many of them are aiming for a tight GX and also the non GX Zorak as well as a potential option if he wants to attack with that one because it can also be getting around the two shot range whilst also. Um, denying two prize knockouts, which is going to be something big for Tord later down the line. Even after two trades, it looks like he didn't find any double colorless energy, though. So I don't think he's going to be ending quite as explosively, despite his board state looking very strong. And the breakthrough Zoroark, actually, with a full bench, will hit 160, with a choice band that will actually hit 190, which is enough to KO pretty much anything on Emily's side of the field, as long as it doesn't have a Fighting Fury belt on it. So, obviously, Emily's going to have to be really careful controlling his bench, making sure he doesn't go into that trap. But also, Tord needs to bear that in mind, and it's kind of, control your bench, or I will get a cheeky KO on a non-GX Pokemon, which could be a swing in the game. It's pretty much Tord's only option for a one-hit KO this game, but it's certainly something he's bearing in mind. And I wouldn't be surprised to see him leaving that Zorua there, so he can either go breakthrough if he needs to, or go for a third GX if the situation arises. Yeah, that's definitely a great point. So we are going to see passing it back over here. There's going to be an Ultra Ball. Looks like eyeing up a couple of these Fighting Fury Belts, which might be going into the discard pile very early. It's not too bad for him, seeing as though he knows that Tord plays four copies of Field Blower anyway, so it's not like he's going to be able to keep those Fighting Fury Belts on the board for long regardless. So getting those in the discard pile is a little bit awkward, but overall he's going to have to accept the fact that Tord has so many options to get rid of these energy. And we're going to see a big Kiawe here after he searches out a Ho-Oh, GX, we're going to see Kiawe. Looks like it's going to be onto that ho I have to imagine, because this is a Pokemon that hits a base output of 180. And me and Ross have both already said that if he whiffs one-hit KOs, he's going to be in a bad spot. This is the best way to guarantee one-hit knockouts throughout the game. And I don't want to be too boastful here, Joe, but I think I might have mentioned the Ho-Oh Kiawe play just a couple <laughs> of minutes ago. It's such a good play, because Tord has nothing that can one-hit KO a ho when it's got all of that energy on it and with a single steam up you're hitting 210 there goes the Zoroark GX without a steam up on a Glycopod you're hitting 360 that is more than enough to get a one hit KO it becomes a great attack and now there is that requirement that you must wait a turn to attack again with a Ho-Oh but with stuff like Guzma all over the place we've got plenty of options let's not worry about that until we come to it I think that Kiawe play was absolutely great. And like I said, Tord needs to get the damage on the board before Emily gets all of this energy on. Well, now the clock just got a little bit shorter. Absolutely. So he actually opted to evolve into the non-GX Zorak straight away before any of the trades started to take place. Then we see the first trade from Tord getting rid of the Ace of Roller. He's definitely looking for double colorless energy again. If he's able to get it, he could freely retreat the Tapu Koko, attach... Uh, double Colors Energy, then Guzma up the Ho-Oh and start trying to pressure it before it gets any of its attacks off, because of course Tapu Koko does hit the Ho-Oh GX for weakness. Probably a great line, but it looks like even after two more trades, still no Double Colors Energy, so if he wants to get any damage in this turn, he needs to play the end that's waiting in his hand. And just to confirm, there are no Double Colorless Energy prize. Tord has them all in his deck. Mm -hmm. He's just not drawing into them at the moment. And this has got to be disheartening. Even if, and it's not wow. an amazing play, but even if he was able to get something like a Guzma, hit the ho -Oh with a Zoroark, accept that it's being KO'd, but then get the return KO, and you've kind of traded one for one, but got rid of the biggest threat. I've seen players do that before. It's not amazing, but it can be an option in some circumstances. But it's a completely moot point if you can't get the double colourless. And it looks like a big Professor Sycamore here. Tord frustrated by the fact that he can't grab himself double colourless energy. He's saying, you know what? This end may not get me, but it looks like the Professor Sycamore didn't even get him double colourless energy either. He has dug through so far into his deck and still 
whiffing on energy. Nobody can accuse Torn of not trying here. That's so harsh. It was that two trades and a Professor Sycamore. That's drawing 11 cards of your deck, and he didn't get it. And now he's forced into a first impression. First impression for 150 is great. It's not a one-hit KO, but it does enough damage that it should be good for a little poke later in the game. Even something like a Tapu Lele could finish that off. Although not in range of a flying flip, which is very crucial. Problem is... It's weak to fire and it's in the active position. That's not ideal. And Emily here is, well, I would say going for a float stone. He's only playing two of them, so it's not that likely. But if he hits one of his two float stones before Todd hits one of his four double colorless, that, that's going to continue Todd's frustration here. Yeah, I think he got a Max Elixir as well as a Guzma. I think that's one of the final cards he does still have Instruct available to him, I believe. So Emily could go for a Guzma approach to move this Volcanian EX out of the active position, but at the same time, the Glycepod looks like some juicy prizes right now. Uh, Emily does still have the Tapu Lele as a potential option to take two prizes on, or he could go for the Instruct before using the Guzma to see if he could get a steam up and maybe deal with one of these Zoroark GX. Yeah, I mean, he's got a lot of options, and he actually laid them out beautifully there, Joe. Personally, I would still want the Floatstone to KO the Glycopod, but we do just see a Professor Sycamore here, so mm. it looks like Emily agrees with me here. But if he misses the Floatstone, he could be giving up a pretty much guaranteed KO. And his face says he didn't get it. The face and the crowd that we have back there as well also <laughs> screaming at the ooh because there was a big miss on Floatstone there. And you can see it on his facial expression. It's a big break for Tord here. No Floatstone and it's a real bailout for him. And I think maybe the Guzma there, maybe the Guzma was the play. Get rid of, the, I mean the Tapu Lele at least would have been a two prize knockout there. Mm -hmm. Tord has got to be sighing relief. And here's a great thing here. He can actually first impression for a KO without coming into the active here, which means he's essentially, he's, he's trading one for one, and that would be lovely. Whatever he leaves in the active is almost certainly going to get KO'd this turn. So he might as well leave the Glycopod in the active because that takes the least amount of energy to be KO'd, or the least amount of, you know, by energy I literally mean effort, I yeah. suppose, here. So you might as well leave it in the active. It's going to get KO'd. Let it get KO'd. And then maybe you can take down the Ho-Oh before it takes down a Zoroark. Yeah, or he does have the option to use Stand-In as well, bringing in the non-EX Zoroark to take the two prizes and force Emily to try and go into an awkward amount of prize trade. So that could also be another option for him. I think there is a double color synergy finally in his hand. It's about time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> We'll see what Todd wants to do here. He's also eyeing up a Guzma. Yet to play a supporter, of course. He has a couple of trades available to him. And uh, he does, in fact, go for the Volcanian. He even has the option now to attach the double colors to the Golisopod and go for the GX attack and take two prizes here. And that's exactly what he's going for. I mean, Golisopod is not a great attacker in this matchup because you're weak to fire. But if you can take a KO on an EX for two prizes while putting another EX 30 damage away from being KO'd, that is pretty good. And then you're like, I don't really even care that he's getting KO'd. He's done more than enough work. Let's let him have a rest in the discard pile. <laughs> and also, not only taking two prize cards, he's taking three energy off this board and leaving uh, just the Ho-Oh GX remaining as the only viable attacker, really. We know there are some Max Elixirs, and Volcanian's no stranger to getting a bunch of energy back on the board. But even still, Tord is really taking the, um, the board presence back in his favor here. And it's such a good play here. I love what he's doing. I think he's probably going to conserve the non-GX Zoroark. I think that's going to sit on the bench because if Emily ever accidentally puts down a fifth bench Pokemon, that really opens up the door for Todd to get a two-prize knockout of a single-prize Pokemon, which is so punishing in a game like this. I think that's going to stay on the bench, but this Golisopod is putting in so much work here. And... One of the things, you mentioned about the non-EX, uh, the, the Volcanian there, mm -hmm. it's got 130 HP. Zoroark hits for a maximum 120. Glycopod hits now that the GX attack has gone away for a maximum 120. He can't actually one-hit KO it. No, that could definitely be uh, the route back into this game using and utilizing the high HP of that uh, basic non-GX Pokemon on his own side. We are going to see he's actually going to opt to maybe promote this. In fact, he's going to go for the Orangaroo, so maybe he's eyeing up a Guzma play already this turn. 
based on his hand. He does have some Max Elixirs, which he can play, as we've already mentioned. There's a Tapu Lele in there, so he could be going for a Guzma play this turn for sure. I think that's almost certainly it. I think if he's leaving the um, Orangaroo in the active, that's probably going to go quite badly. <laughs> and we've got to think back to the turn earlier in the game where maybe a Guzma play could have been used. He went for the Floatstone. He missed the Floatstone. Yeah. And that really did give the swing towards Tord there. So here he needs to just start taking prizes. And to be honest here, even though the Golisopod has got all of the energy on and the choice band, I still would prefer to see a Zoroark KO here, because that's the bigger threat. Zoroark needs a steam up to be KO'd. Golisopod would you get KO'd by just a free energy Volcano EX with no mm -hmm. steam ups. You can leave that till later. And as we say that, there is a Turtonator on the bench. So Tord has got to be thinking now, double colorless energy choice band. <laughs> he needs a field blower. He's playing four of them. Yeah, and he can dig so far into his deck with those trades. That is one of the big things we keep seeing with this archetype so the first max elixir does hit for the turtonator gx that's starting to get powered up that's really important especially because it looks like there's going to be a guzma being played this turn i'm not sure if there are any actual fire energy in the hand so uh, may have to be content with going for the tapu lele here just to keep up in prizes or the galisopod as well as a potential option and uh, we do see the second Max Elixir does fail, which is a little bit awkward. But to move this Orangaroo, to guarantee it at least, it might be a Guzma play. I mean, how is he missing Max Elixirs playing 15 energy? <laughs> when in the previous game, we were seeing Max Elixir after Max Elixir hit in a deck that only played nine basic energy. Doesn't seem particularly fair. Unfortunately, these things happen. There is an element of luck. Is there any argument for using a Guzma to KO the other Zoroark here, the non-GX, given that it might take a two-prize knockout? Uh, potentially, but I think just because Tord will likely use the Tapu Koko anyway, uh, seeing as though it's also a really efficient one-energy attacker against the ho -Oh GX specifically, it's likely that naturally there's going to be um, the seven-prize game presented via the Tapu Koko that the Zoroark anyway could end up being a liability regardless. So uh, I think taking the two prizes, keeping up in the race is going to be the most important thing right now. And let's not forget, if he flying flips twice, not only will he KO the yeah. Ho-Oh, he will also KO that Bench Volcanian that's got 30 HP remaining. And four prizes is better than two. I did some maths to work <laughs> it out and it checked out. And uh, we know even though there is only one copy of Tapu Koko, two flying flips will win toward the game. He still has all of his puzzles of time remaining. So he can simply uh, do one flying flip with a choice band, does 100 damage to the active Ho-Oh, and most importantly, 20 to the already heavily damaged uh, Volcanian EX. And if he's able to then repeat the combo and go for, once again, a choice band, double colorless, and recover the Tapu Koko itself, he could also, actually, he would also need a field blower. Then he would be able to get this clean four prizes over two turns. I mean, good news, he's got a Mallow, yep. and with trade, he's guaranteeing two cards. He's got the double colourless energy in his hand. He's actually going choice band field blower, so yeah, this is pretty much what's happening here. But also, I think I can see double puzzle of time mm -hmm. in his hand, yeah. which means, and I doubt he'll use it this turn. Why would he? He doesn't need it. Yeah. But next turn, like you say, let's recover the Tapu Coco, double colourless energy, choice band, and that is literally the game. That is all four prizes remaining. And Emily here, he can KO the Tapu Coco for a single prize, but then Tord recovers it and actually wins by three full prizes. Yeah, Tord is really manipulating this game perfectly. We are going to see this Mallow. What's great as well is his deck is really thin right now, and he's going to also be able to mill two really bad cards that are currently in his giant hand. So <laughs> even when he is going to get hit with N, he'll have more trades to get back into this combination. So Tord once again going to uh, use that Mallow, gets the Field Blower, which he instantly plays. We are actually going to see the stand-in from Zoroark with the Choice Band, so not going for the uh, Tapu Koko approach. Maybe it's a little bit clutching of straws. Maybe it requires too much. But with the choice band, this is actually going to get a knockout because there's a full bench from Emily. And that is what I was saying. If Emily uh, benched a fifth Pokemon, I've said it multiple times throughout the game. I do have a special love for that Zoroark. I've played it in so many decks. And it's the only thing Tord can use to get a big one-hit KO. Now, this means he doesn't win the game next turn on a flying flip. But it means he does win it on a Guzmarund 
almost any attack <laughs> from any one of his Pokemon. Yeah. So I still think he's in a wonderful position here. Maybe we were getting a little bit too cute there. There's still good old Guzma that can finish off that heavily damaged Volcanion. But here we go. There is only one energy on this Volcanion uh, player's side right now. And that is very rare. It's a very rare thing to see so few energy on the board. One good thing he does have going for him is that there is a Turtonator that has the one energy on it right now. So it is likely going to be a Nitro Chank GX followed up up after this N because he really does have to deny Tord. His hand size was, I think, a ridiculous amount, probably over 15 cards at that point. It was a lot, and he needs to not accidentally bench another Pokemon here because then Zoroark <laughs> will just win the game. Although I'm going to have to correct you, Joe. We weren't getting too cute. I was on the Zoroark train the second it left the station. <laughs> But I think here for Tord, you know, he, he's got those trades. We've been talking all weekend about trade. He's not actually being N to two here. He's basically being N to six. And this is going to be it. Um Emily actually only getting four for himself. He does have one manual attachment on top of this nitro tank. He also gets himself a field blower as well, which could be helpful, keeping things out of range a little bit. And uh, he is going to remove that choice band while he can. And um, this is going to be a big nitro tank trying to recover um, his board state with lots of energy here, but he's in a really bad spot. And the most annoying thing for Emily here has got to be, what does he really nitro tank onto? Mm, the Volcanium with 30 damage remaining? <laughs> it's sort of, I feel like it's going to have to be the non-EX Volcanium, maybe even the Oranguru as well, looking to pick up prizes elsewhere, but uh, even onto the Turtonator, but instead he's going to go for the Shell Trap here. That's interesting. Of course, the maths works out. Mm -hmm. If Zoroark attacks, it will take eight damage counters and be KO'd, but I think... There oh, there we go. There's the <laughs> Guzma. KO's... Um, just to follow it through, Coco in the active, Coco retreats, Zoroark goes in and takes the KO. Tor takes game one, and we are now just one game away from finally putting a Norwegian into the top four <laughs> of the international championships at the fourth attempt. But of course, Emily didn't get his deck doing what it really needed to do that game. You, I think the way you put it, Joe, was absolutely perfect. Tord manipulated that game. He was in a position where he could. He took advantage of his opportunities. He played it perfectly. And he really did put himself in a position to win. Emily, this game, all it's going to take is an early Kiawe, maybe on turn one because he's going first. Couple of Max Elixirs to hit, setting up three attackers, couple of steam ups, and we could see, you know, a free four turn win here. Absolutely, but we have to bear in mind that Emily didn't have his ideal setup. There was the turn one where he was going second and he wasn't able to float stone the Volcanian EX to get Power Heater. That's the main way that you are able to get multiple energies on the board whilst also getting early damage into play. But even at the second turn of asking, he wasn't able to move his uh, his uh, Volcanian EX as well. So he really missed a couple of important turns of getting damage on the board. Even though he was getting energy on the field, Tord was being proactive and dealing with those attackers before they got any value. And you've got a question here. Because in the previous game, Emily went a little bit aggressive. He went, right, I'm pretty sure I'm going to get the Floatstone. Play the Sycamore. Ah, I missed the Floatstone. Missed the KO. This is going very badly. Does that make him play a little bit more conservative in the second game? Does he remember that he missed that and go, next time, I'm going to play the Guzma. It's not the exact KO I wanted, but I'd rather get a suboptimal KO than no KO at all. Or does he just carry on playing like he does? We've not seen him playing in top eight before on a big stage. We don't really know how he's going to react. But that's something we've got to bear in mind with players. When they take that kind of risk and it doesn't pay off, do they remain a little bit gung-ho? Or do they rein it in and play slightly more conservatively in the future? It's definitely going to be playing on his mind. But he has to put that to one side. He has... A lot of time left on the clock. He has two games to try and bring this back. He's going first, so that's one extra turn. Tord has to wait to start evolving his Pokemon, so it's way more likely that Emily is going to be uh, pushing the advantage, taking early prizes with Power Heater. We know how incredibly strong it is uh, at dealing with these lower HP Pokemon. Taking some of these one prizes off the board early on could be the key to victory in the second game. I agree with that one entirely. Couple cheeky early prizes, couple steam ups of big KOs in the mid to late game. And that is, well, that will be all she wrote. <laughs> now, we do see a mulligan there. It wasn't actually a terrible hand. No, uh, if there was a basic Pokemon in there, especially if it was a non EX Volcanian, that would be ideal. But, that would uh, be a great start. <laughs> unfortunately, you're not allowed to choose those, and uh, he's going to have to <laughs> shuffle it in. And uh, Tord provided yep he has some basic Pokemon, so he's going to get a little bit of advantage. This is what is um, what happens when. 
one player can't get a basic Pokemon in their starting hand, there is going to be one extra draw for you the, for the opponent, almost as an apology to say, sorry, I'm wasting your time here. <laughs> and annoyingly, that's exactly how I would have phrased it, so I have nothing to add on the whole <laughs> mulligan debate. So cheers for that one, Joe. <laughs> I mean, here, it's all about the start of Emily. Todd is probably going to do very similar to what he did last game. One of the things I really liked about the previous game with Todd is, oh, he's got a Ho-Oh, does he, it doesn't have a key, he's got a Ho-Oh and a Volcano, but he doesn't have a Kiawe. I like the way he went, you know what? I know I'm not supposed to use Golisopod. I know it's weak to fire, and I know you're going to punish me, but if I can get enough damage on the board and the KO, it doesn't actually matter. But we are going, and it looks like we've got... Well, like I said, a Volcanian. Volcanian EX once again in the active position. It looks like it's going to be a Professor Sycamore getting rid of a couple of fire energy. Losing the enhanced hammer is a little bit frustrating, seeing as though how Tord is so reliant on double colorless energy. Also a Guzma hitting the discard pile as well. But it's no bad thing to have a few fires in there. He's definitely going to be able to cash in on those later on in the game. And straight away into a Max Elixir, that hits. Yeah, Max Elixir is lovely. It also hits another Max Elixir, incidentally. But you cannot stack them. That would be a cool effect if you could. <laughs> if you hit a Max Elixir while playing a Max Elixir, play that one as well. Might be a little bit silly. Now... The fire in the discard is great because, of course, the non-EX Volcanian's power heater needs them in the discard. If he could somehow, and he's got a Sycamore, which he might be playing, if he were able to hit a Flowstone and a non-EX Volcanian by next turn, that would really give him a great start. He could maybe take a KO with the power heater while accelerating energy around his board. And if he's taking a couple of prizes while building up his big Pokemon on the, the bench, I think we would then see a very different game to the one that we saw you know, in game one. Yeah, definitely a different game. But Tord, guess what? He started with one of his three Bridgets, so he can also... <laughs> it's a big sigh of relief for him, and uh, he's also going to be able to look at his prizes. Uh, nothing too awkward for him. Both players actually pretty reasonable prizes overall. So Tord is going to be able to build up his bench as well. Again, most likely the Tapu Koko in combination with a couple of these Zeruas, and uh, that's exactly what he's going to go for here. As he sets up his board, that's pretty much all he can ask for on the first turn. It doesn't look like he has any energy in turn one. And even if he had any, I don't think it would be that reasonable to play it unless he was, for example, retreating Zerua to try and protect it. No, because even something like a Guzma could then KO the benched yeah. one and then he loses all that energy. I mean, I am considering whether Tord might want to win ball at some point. Let's not forget that it was the GX attack combined with the Choice Band, a Crossing Cut GX, that mm -hmm. did get a one-hit KO on a Volcanium. If Amelie doesn't, pro uh, doesn't bench five Pokemon, the only way of getting a one-hit KO is against a Tapu Lele or a Volcanium EX with a Crossing Cut GX Choice Band. It might be an option at some point for Tord to just pop a Wimpod with a Grass Energy down mm -hmm. and just leave it. So then at some point later on in the game, he could go Golisopod, Double Colorless, Choice Band, Guzma. Okay, I know that's a lot to ask for. <laughs> but he might be using three trades in a turn, yeah. which means he's drawing seven cards, which actually makes it not that much to ask yeah. for. When there's trade involved, it's never much to ask for. And he actually does have a Wimpod in his hand right now. I think he might leave the bench slot open, depending on what his hand is, because he might need Tapu Lele as an out for next turn. So I didn't see many other supporters going on in his hand. I think just some of the Acer Rollers and Guzmas. So he may be a little bit um, behind here. Even though he got the brilliant turn one, he may be stuck on the next turn. He might... He might end up with a Zoroark. That would be great start <laughs> trading. And it's so good. I mean, how many games, Joe, have you realistically played where you don't have to bench a Tapu Lele? Uh, definitely a lot less than Tord because he plays so, <laughs> so many Bridgets that um, he just really gets away with it so much more often. Typically, almost every deck looks for a turn one supporter, be it the Bridget. Even Lily is being used in some decks as well, some of the more aggressive ones. Um, but yeah, Tord having that high of a Bridget count, it's only appropriate for a deck that he is playing, but he's proving why it is so powerful. It is really, really great. And of course, you can trade those Bridgets later on for cards you'd rather have. Now, I think at this stage, Emily is really going to be looking for a Fighting Fury belt. Phoenix Burn, well, it's not going to be possible. He's already attached an energy. But also, Sacred Fire does 50 damage to anywhere on your opponent's field. It's not really enough to do very much. What you would love here is a Fighting Fury belt. Pop it on the ho -Oh, then you're hitting for 60 to the active, and he hits it here. There it is. So he's going to get a KO on that Zerua turn one. Already we're seeing a very different start, and that means that Phoenix Burn is still on the field as a potential attack next turn to KO something like a 2 prize Zoroark. And you see there, you know, 
Taunt and so little reaction that basically says, I kind of wish you hadn't drawn that. <laughs> yeah, a little bit of pain shown in his expression there. We are simply going to see the Sacred Fire in the active position. You can choose anywhere on the opponent's field. Taunt immediately promoting the Tapu Koko. And Taunt does, does indeed draw into exactly what you said he could. The <laughs> Zoroark GX. That's a big sigh of relief for him. And uh, oh, he already <laughs> actually had one in his hand. It was so shiny it was difficult to see. He actually has an Ultra Ball. Okay, his hand is crazy here. <laughs> his hand is really good. He must be like, and here's the thing about trade, right? If you've got one card in hand, you trade and draw two. Yeah. Then you trade and draw two. Then you trade and draw two, and trade fuels trade, and that is, I mean, it's not an economics lesson, I am just talking about Zoroark here. It's just <laughs> so good to just be able to constantly refill your hand. You draw two cards, get rid of one to draw two cards, it is so much fun to be playing Zoroark. You don't care about N, you don't need Tapu Lele after the first couple of turns. I, I spoke in the introduction today when I was on the stage with Lou about how Zoroark has really taken over this weekend in the trading card game. And Tor is just giving us more examples of why. So Tor definitely going to be going for the uh, wonder tag here with Tapu Lele. He has the interesting option. He can guarantee double colorless energy with Mallow or he could go for Professor Sycamore. We saw, as we mentioned earlier, Ross, will players adapt their play based on the first game? And he has been known to whiff on double colorless energy so he could <laughs> guarantee it with Mallow but he's also eyeing up that Professor Sycamore thinking, it can't happen twice, can it? <laughs> I think he's really hoping it doesn't. <laughs> the thing about Mallow this early in the game is it gets you any two cards and that's great. But then you've still got a really large hand. Trade is an amazing ability at any stage of the game. But the lower your deck size gets, the easier it's going to be to hit the cards you want. Even if you're drawing multiple cards per turn, we saw Tor draw 11 cards and miss the double colorless. So if he can just thin his deck a little bit as he plays his Sycamore's early game, it means that in the late game, trade is going to be so much better. And you're right, he is just thinking, it can't happen two games in a row that that's not fair. And actually, Joe, I think he is adapting his play again because I think he's taking your Tapu Coco advice. Yeah, finally going for it. But <laughs> there it. is a miss of double <laughs> colorless energy. He still has four draws, potentially six, because he does have an Ultra Ball in hand and he could go for another Zorak GX. Um, so... We'll see if he can do it here. Hopefully we did hear a crowd reaction there. <laughs> yeah. When he drew the cards, as we were saying, he missed it. We just heard this, ah! Oh! Yeah, I mean... <laughs> Look, Todd's going to say, you know what, this can't happen again. I'm going to Ultra Ball right away, grab myself a Zorak GX, give myself the highest odds, six more draws after using a Professor Sycamore, and uh, also using the Ultra Ball before any of the trades, because then, of course, he's thinning one extra card from his deck. This can't happen again, surely not. I know we've made jokes about <laughs> it, but it's so many draws. It's so many draws. Good news is here, he's actually drawing even more cards than last time. Last time it was 11, this time it's 13 cards from his deck, and and, like you say, grabbing the Zoroark takes a card out of his deck, giving him a slightly higher chance of being able to hit it with a trade. You've got to think he's going to hit the double colorless here. And it's only going to get him two prizes off the Ho-Oh, but it's also whittling down those bench Pokemon a little bit. Does he hit it? <sighs> Round Not one. Yet. Round one's a miss. The Mallow there <laughs> taunting him as well. He can <laughs> grab a Wimpod. There's a Tapu Lele. And oh, a double colorless it. energy. There we go. Finally gets a double colorless. But if he gets a couple of flying flips, then all of a sudden, that Volcanian comes from 180 to 140. The... Turtonator comes from 190 down to 150. Well, Zoroark GX can hit 150, and that could actually two flying flips here, and then two attacks with Zoroark GX. That could literally be all Tord needs to book his place in top four. So here is the final trade from Tord. He still had one remaining, so what we were worried about when we thought he was going to miss one. And uh, we are going to see the double colors energy most likely being attached to the Tapu Koko, as you mentioned. That uh, <laughs> Emily, there's some showmanship. He's saying, oh, wow, you actually hit that double colors energy. What were the odds <laughs> with 13 cards that you drew? And <laughs> it's going to be a big 100 damage to the active, as well as setting up some of these Pokemon, getting them a little bit more in range for Zorox later on in the game. So really great stuff from him. And as a nice, it passes back over. Sorry, a nice flourishy hand movement there to show, like, just so we're clear, I'm hitting all of your Pokemon. <laughs> it is one of the best spread Pokemon that we still have in the format, and uh, it's a really awkward spot here. Does he keep committing to the ho -Oh GX? It feels like that's the only Pokemon he has currently set up. Again, uh, he does have a non-EX Volcanium, but it requires a ridiculous amount of steam-ups in order to get there, so it feels like he's going to have to allow this ho -Oh to get 
knocked out just taking a single prize on the Tapu Koko just because it's such a threat here. Unless he wants to... Yeah, he can't really go for the Guzma play because he doesn't have enough energy to do a Phoenix Burn anywhere. So he's going to have to commit this Ultra Ball, find himself uh, a new, maybe a new supporter card via Tapu Lele, um, or try and set up his board a little bit more. He does have an N currently in his hand as well as a Float Stone. And I'm not sure if that's going to be cutting it for him just yet. And this is what's really upsetting. We're talking about, oh, he's had a much better start. He's hit a Max Elixir. He's got all this energy on a Ho-Ho. -Oh. And Torn is basically forcing him into the situation of going, ah, you got four, you got four energy onto your 190 HP GX, did you? Well, enjoy your single prize that you're taking by doing so. Because <laughs> even if the Tapu Koko doesn't come back next turn, and that clearly, I think, would be the optimal play here, yeah. just something like... A Zoroark GX would then be able to finish it off. And this is everything that Tord needs here. Two flying flips will set him up for the game, but even without the second flying flip, it's not just getting rid of the Ho-Ho, -Oh, it's getting rid of the energy. We've said this in a bunch of games already today. If you can go after the energy, it doesn't matter if you take a little bit longer to take out the Pokemon because your opponent is sitting there doing nothing to give you extra turns to take out the Pokemon. It's exactly what we said was happening in the first game that Tord just sort of stifling the setup of Amelie. There's so much energy for these massive attackers it's great if they can get you know four prizes for their two just because they can do so much damage and normally are able to take at least one attack but Tord's just able to target them down get them in range and again there's not been any power heaters going on there's never been the good opportunity to do so because Tord evolved into his GX's so quickly everything's in a high HP range and uh He's sort of playing catch-up already, even though he's ahead one prize. Just the board state is just so aggressive from Tord. It's not, unfortunately, looking particularly good here. So we do see Tord um, and Emily, you know, they're both getting a new hand and and all of that. But Emily's in a really awkward position here. He has got the energy. Phoenix Burn is an option for him here. But he takes one single prize and he passes over to Tord. Now, he does know that Tord is not good at drawing double colorless energy. <laughs> But he has still got all three of those trades available to him. I would have liked to have seen a Wimpod on the board at some point, just so that if you don't get that double colorless energy, you've still got the option of getting one of your free grass energy. If you can use first impression to take two prizes, it doesn't really matter if you give up two prizes directly afterwards, because you're kind of trading one for one, but you're taking out your opponent's biggest threat while they're taking out the Pokemon that you weren't relying on because you knew you weren't able to here. Now, he doesn't actually have a way of getting out the active at the moment. So even if he can recover the Tapu Koko, he is going to need to get a Pokemon out of the active. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit awkward. Yeah, because uh, his main means of moving Pokemon is either a Cerola or Guzma. And that's not going to be uh, viable right now because he wants to finish off the ho OGX. So he may have to be content to two-shot this with uh, a Zoroark, which he has promoted. Um, not only does he have double colorless energy, he also has Puzzle of Time now as an out, so hopefully we'll see no more whiffs of these um, energy cards so Tor can keep attacking. There's the first trade, getting him to uh, not very viable options. We're going to see a second trade, getting rid of the grass energy. He's digging hard for double colors, somehow still whiffing it at every opportunity. This is actually incredible at this point. Uh, he drew into two dud cards, in fact, a Mr. Mime and a Bridget. He doesn't need either of those, so he can discard one of them with his final trade if he wishes. He may also be analyzing the hand and say, is it actually worth me use, using a Professor Sycamore before I use trade here, unless I draw into some good cards that I would rather not discard later on? Yeah, uh, you know, just really maximizing the chances of getting it here. It, it is so painful to be missing it turn after turn. Of course, this is the risk you play. If you're playing four copies of one card, the maximum you can, that's all you can do. That is a lot of cards if he plays a <laughs> Professor Sycamore, though. He's considering it. He's looking at it. He's thinking, I can get away with these two N going. I don't mind the Guzmas. I still have puzzles of time. But no, he is going to go for the Mr. Mime. And he does find himself double color synergy and a big sigh of relief from them, uh, from him there. You could see it in his facial expression that, man, that Professor Sigamore would have been way too painful if he were to miss once again, however unlikely it was. And here we go. We are going to see a righteous, a right, riotous beating. There, you there go. we go. <laughs> to finish off this Ho-Oh GX. There isn't much else he needs to do in his turn, but he can still go for a Bridget. Maybe now is time to get out a Wimpod, maybe just thin the deck. Maybe he's simply playing the Bridget so he doesn't have it 
any way as an option just because he has no other supporters to play here. Just getting it out of his hand. If you can't trade it away, you can always just play the card and get that out of your deck. Indeed, and I do love that this is a deck that really... You know, you play free Bridget because you want the turn one Bridget, but you're going to spend the rest of the game just discarding cards you don't want from your hand. So play free Bridget, which would be a little bit over the top in most decks, is actually quite nice because you've got the option of going, you know what, it doesn't really matter. I can just use it to trade it away later. It does mean... Now, he's actually not got the KO yet. He is going to need... He's oh, no, he is. Sorry, I do yeah, apologise. Yeah. I'm thinking the old Raichu that hits for only the bench. <laughs> he does exactly 100, which will be enough to get the KO. 200 damage will be enough. And now Emily has no energy on the field whatsoever. And... I suppose it's possible he can KO this Zoroark, but he's going to need to start hitting Max Elixirs pretty quickly. And as you can see, he's starting to look at the Fighting Fury Belt, committing that to the uh, non-EX Volcanion. I think that's definitely going to be his route here. Try and get some power heaters going. He needs to set up multiple attackers. And if he can get some chip damage in on the Zoroark GX in the process, that definitely could be his best line, especially because we've seen that 130 HP is so annoying for Tor to deal with, even though it is just one prize. So this is definitely going to be the best route he can take. We are going to see the manual attachment of Fire Energy to that Volcanion. Does he have any more steam ups in there? I don't think I see many more red cards in his hand. He's There's got at least one. one. There's one. So he can deal 60 damage, which is going to be helpful. He's also going to Fighting Fury Belt his Turtonator GX as well. And uh, he... I don't think he can lower his hand size enough to get any instruct draws, so he is simply going to retreat into that Volcanion and go for the Power Heater just for the 30 damage. No steam ups being played, and we're going to see an energy on both one of his uh, Volcanion EX as well as that Turtonator. And this makes a big difference. We talked about Power Heater previously, and we said, OK, he can do the Power Heater, but then again, he doesn't really have valid targets on his board. And when you're using the Power Heater, you're attaching energy to two bench Pokémon. You need the right bench Pokémon. When you've got a Turtonator with just 20 damage on and a Fighting Fury about that's a great target. When you've got a Volcanion EX, has got no damage on that's a great target and now next turn either another power heater or something like a max elixir would fix it and let's not forget choice band does not work against volcanium zoroark does a maximum 120 Golisopod does a maximum 120 irrelevant because it's not even on the field the only real attacker he's got here is zoroark so that Volcanion, even if one of his four field blowers comes down, Tord is not getting a one-hit KO on that Zoroark. That is crucial. It means that Emily should be able to get another power heater off and then really have multiple attackers. He's only got four prizes left. So if he's got two attackers, two big KOs, he wins. That's very true. And uh, Tord looking through his discard pile now because I think he has simply traded into uh, a second puzzle of time finally. So he has the option to recycle some of these cards and uh, I think most likely his hand size is so ridiculous he can definitely go for a Guzma play if he wishes to move the Zorak out of the active to make sure, as you said, there's no point in him trying to hit this non EX Volcanion. He wants to take two prizes every single turn and uh, we can see one of the targets from that puzzle of time, definitely the Tapu Koko. That's something he's a big fan of recovering and uh, he may just be going for a double colorless energy. He already does have one in his hand so instead going to go for the choice band potentially trying to set some of these GX Pokemon back in range um, so Zorak can finish them off later on. And I like this a lot. I think going for a flying flip here would be a really good play. It brings Volcanion down into range for Zorak. It brings both the Volcanion EX and the Turtonator GX on the board down into range of Zorak with a choice band. <laughs> I think it's a really good way to go. He opts to go for the Guzma with both hands. That's how confident he is that that's the target he wants to promote. It's uh, one of the Volcanians with that big, chunky retreat cost. There's already one Floatstone committed, of course, on the Orangaru. So Tord hoping that once again... Oh, and also there's a Field Blower. So even some Guzma plays may be a little bit more awkward now that that Floatstone's gone on the bench. As well as that Fighting Fury Belt making the Turtonator uh, a little bit less chunky. So we are going to see... Uh, Tor trying to cash in on this flying flip again, making sure that the most dangerous uh, EX attackers and GXs um, on Amelie's side of the field are always going to be in range of a one-hit KO. 
And I just said a minute ago, well, he'll get two, he'll get another power heater, two big attackers, two big KOs, he wins the game. Well, actually, Tord, Tord apparently didn't want that to happen. Tord no. wasn't cool with that. But now what we see is Tord actually going, look, I know I can't get big one-hit KOs, but I know that you play no healing. And by now, you've got to think Tord probably knows he only plays two floatstones, <laughs> but he's got the other one already. Other one already in his hand, even though it is a low hand size. He also has a couple of fire energy to play with. We're going to see a field blower in response trying to get rid of that choice band that was recovered uh, by the puzzles. So uh, both players identifying how important it is to have that to fix some damage. And uh, with these fire energy, are we going to see some manual attachments to some Pokemon or are we going to see some steam ups trying to deal with this Tapu Koko? I think it's unlikely that he's going to be able to get a knockout on the Tapu Koko. So maybe it's best just to stick with um, manually attaching and trying to set up some Pokemon here. I think that's probably the call. I was just running through the maths in my head. He's yeah. got a Fighting Fury bout, so he does 30, which means even with two steam ups, mm -hmm. you're still only doing 90. You need three steam ups here to go and get the KO. It's not that likely, so just getting some energy on the board. Um, is he going? To, is he hasn't used manual attachment yet, has he? So I think he's considering where to put that. And then Power Heater. Oh, I think he's eschewed the uh, manual attachment for the time being. Yeah, he's... Uh chosen to keep both in hand, maybe keeping them around for steam ups for future turns so that he can hopefully blow up some of these Zoroark GX if he can, if he can eventually access them with Guzma. Uh, so passes back over to Tord here. He's going to once again look to go for a Guzma play. Maybe this time he'll go for a Righteous Beating though and continue to take some prize cards. And everything's now in range. All of the big EXs on Emily's side of the field are now in range. And that is what he didn't want to happen. <laughs> the whole point of this game where Emily was I can take big one hit KOs and you can't no 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 unfortunately now Tord can it's a big trade from Tord he drew into double colorless energy and Guzma I think uh, he's still looking for maybe another choice band or a puzzle of time to finish off the combination so with ooh, looks like a couple of whiffs and he's counting his deck saying wow was that really the odds and I just missed my choice band and or puzzle of time but at the same time it's uh his hand size is so large he might already have it in there he's just trying to use every trade possible getting as few cards in his deck that are useless um just getting them all out of the hand so we are going to have a look toward checking the discard pile i think he actually does have the combination you know i think he has choice band plus uh double colors energy plus guzma and I think we could be seeing all three of these come down this turn. And uh, here it is, going to be the double colorless energy onto a fresh Zoroark GX, making it as difficult as possible for a response knockout. There is yeah. the choice band as well. And it is going to be a Guzma. It's got to be on that Turtonator GX, you would think. Oh, that is the most punishing one. It take, Yeah, because Turtonator needs, was it one, two steam ups, mm -hmm. whereas Volcanion needs more than that. Three steam ups if you want to be specific. <laughs> and... He's getting the KO here. More importantly, he's going down to two prizes. Yep. Even though that Volcanian, the non-EX, was in range, Tord would still need to KO either two non uh, two GXs or a GX plus the Orangaroo. It's not the way he wants to go. Tord is basically now a Guzma away from winning the game, although he might need a second choice band if a field blower comes down. And you know what? He's still got those free trades. It's possible that Emily can KO this Zoroark. Even if he does, Tord's got another one waiting in the wings. Next turn, a Guzma Choice Band will win Tord the game. So we are going to see two steam ups here trying to take away this Zoroark because not only does it take away two prizes and keeps Emily in the race, it's also going to get rid of the Choice Band, which is one of the pieces that he does have to remove if he wants to uh, remain in this game. So it's going to be a big end here. Four cards for himself, two for Tord. He also does have potentially some instructs available to him to get him uh, even more cards. He does still have the Power Heater option available to him if he does whiff the knockout, and maybe that's going to be what he settles for. But let's see what he can get off of these four cards. I mean, even just a retreating into a power heater would be all right. The yeah. thing is, Tord is going to win the game next turn for Choice Band Guzma. There's nothing Emily can do to stop that, not with the cards he's playing and with his particular deck list. There's nothing he can do. But if he doesn't take a GSKO this turn, then Tord's got two turns to hit the Guzma Choice Band combo. Yeah. And that just makes it so much easier for him. And I think with the amount of uh, deck that Tord has remaining, he could simply trade almost every card over the course of two turns and make sure that he... Um, gets every resource and guarantees himself the win. So we are going to see a Max Elixir now. He does hit it, so he has the option to attach this elsewhere on his board. 
and uh, he's also going to just take a look at every six here and that's also going to go on to the non-EX Volcanium with two steam ups so far that's dealing 170 damage it looks like if he does opt to go for the second attack but he may just be doing this in order to retreat it on a future turn after still going for a power heater here that would be a potential option he just isn't getting the KO yet though he needs a no. third steam up just to KO with the EX and he doesn't even have a third EX on the field right now no. so the third steam up can't happen and you've got to think at this stage that if Emily doesn't take a KO you've got to think that Tord is going to win we do see the instruct there but nothing doing we might see the steam artillery here for 170 which would be nice but having said that I think You've got to think Tord's probably going to win the game this turn. He's going to pop himself into the top four. Um, still on course to be the first two-time internationals champion, and honestly, which will be nice. Yeah, whenever you see Tord's deck in action, we've seen so many pilots of this list. Not only is Tord playing it expertly, as well as a lot of the other players, but he really does see every single line available. And uh, there's the Kuzma, <laughs> he just chucks it down. Doesn't need to do any trades. Tord breezes into the top four. And we finally have, at uh, the fourth time of asking, put a Norwegian into the top four of the Pokemon Trading Card Game European International Championships 2018. Congratulations to Tord, really cementing his reputation as one of the very best players.